we stopped at <clears throat> talking about how we name microbes. What is the taxonomy? Because I, I'm going to tell you something. One of the things that scientists love to do is to put things in different boxes, like sorting out. It looks like they all have OCDs. Um, and until Carl Linnaeus, which was a Swedish biologist in, I think, 18th century, um, animal names and, and organismal names were all over the place. He was the first person to propose the binomial nomenclature. Okay, So this is pretty much a summary of binomial nomenclature. First word goes for genus, second for species. And you can see it um, with um, humans is not that interesting, but let's say let's take let's take large let's take cats. Latin name, the biological name for house cat is Felis catus. Felis stands for cats as the genus. Catus, cat, house cat. There are other Felis species, larger cats like bobcats. Now if you would go to bigger animals like tiger, uh, tiger would be Panthera tigris. So Panthera is the genus. Tiger is Panthera tigris. Lion is Panthera leo. Uh, leopard is Panthera pardus. Different species belonging to the same genus. For instance, you know, you can cross a lion and a tiger and produce liger, the animal. Seriously, it's, it's a, it's a gi gi gigantic cat, which is infertile. It's a distinguishing feature of cross species um, chimeras, let's put it this way. Uh, in microbial world, the nomenclature is the same, although species the distinguishing species is the bigger problem because microbes do not have sexual reproduction. Well, <clears throat> most of them don't in a traditional way. So bacteria definitely don't have sexual reproduction. But the names are the same. Say you have Staphylococcus aureus. Everybody heard about this guy, right? And then you have Staphylococcus epidermidis, the microbe that's normally dwelling on your skin. They belong to the same genus, but they are very different species. Okay, so first name is for genus, second for species. You you can see Giardia lamblia. Giardia is the genus, lamblia is the species. Bacillus anthracis, Bacillus is genus, anthracis is species. Bacillus anthracis causes anthrax. Okay, there's Bacillus cereus, Bacillus subtilis, other species of the same genus. Uh, binomial nomenclature. Uh, there's a manual called Burgess Manual that describes how to <clears throat> classify and assign microbes. It's a huge compendium. You probably will not need it. There's a, a saying among microbiologists that there is a special place in hell for taxonomists because bacterial names they changed um, they be bacteria being reassigned. Uh, there's one microbe that used to be, I don't know, called this way. Then it turns out, based on the recent analysis, it should have different name and belong to like different class. Okay. And speaking of classes, um, we start with species and go to genus. And then from genus, does anyone know the above classification? Many genera form family. Uh, phylum is way up, but families form orders, orders form classes, classes form types, types form phyla, and phyla form kingdoms. What I told you now is the example of classification according to Whitaker. In 1969, Whitaker published um, his taxonomy system which involved five kingdoms animals plants fungi uh, protists and monera monera was bacteria and archaea protists 
were essentially single-celled eukaryote, mostly protozoans. And fungi, animals, and plants, you know, pretty obvious, right? And he based his classification on the structural similarity. I mean, you look at lion and tiger, well, they're definitely closer than lion and a mouse. So that, that was his take. It wasn't just the external appearance. It was um, a lot of ecological observation, structural observation, comparative physiology, comparative anatomy. So it was a huge work. <clears throat> and, but but the, another thing that he took on that is he tried to base that tree of life that you can see here based on evolutionary proximity. So obviously protists and Monera bacteria and archaea, they evolutionary closer than bacteria and say fungi or animals. So the distance between those kingdoms on the tree reflected the how evolutionary far apart those kingdoms. Does that make sense? Like uh, humans and great apes would be closer than humans and say meerkats okay it worked fine and as usual there was a guy who screwed up everything well screwed up quote unquote uh, in en end of 60s beginning of 70s carl woes professor from the university of chicago was working on bacterial taxonomy. <clears throat> so what he was doing, uh, you know, different bacteria look pretty simple. Honestly, if I'll show you uh, different gram-negative rods like E. coli, um, Salmonella, Klebsiella, I wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to tell them apart. I wouldn't be able to tell them apart. Under the microscope, they look very, very similar. Okay. So his take was that he's going to look at the genome. Now we all understand that all living organisms have genome. What is the function of the genome? What does it contain? Huh? And the DNA, DNA, it's DNA. What, what's the point? What's the function of DNA then? Uh, it's not building blocks. It stores something. Information. It stores information about the whole body, right? And based on the expression of different genes, the, the organism is going to look this or this. Look at us in this room. We all look remarkably different. Although, if you would compare genomes, the difference will be almost non-existent. So it's not only which genes we have, but also how they are expressed. However, we possess, we have more in common actually than, than we are different. From a biological standpoint, we're almost identical. We have same, I don't know, eye structure and function. We have same proteins working in our guts. Does that make sense? But if you compare us to say, okay, meerkats, we look different and we're probably going to have slightly different physiology. And our genomes are going to be different. If you would take human genome and chimp genome, they are 99% similar. Think about that 1%. I know. I know there are several, there's folks that look very much like chimps, but let's not talk about them. In general, we look very different, and 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 it, with that, it's just one percent difference in the whole genome. That's how little it takes to produce such a difference. Humans and mice, their genomes are seventy percent similar. So, the less similar. The genomes are okay the farther uh, genetically species are does that make sense so you can build 
so-called phylogenetic tree based on the genome sequencing. Does that make sense? Which species are closer, which are farther? Is that understood? So that what <clears throat> Carl Woese was doing. He was, um, he didn't sequence the whole genome of each bacteria. Instead, he picked one gene, 16S ribosomal RNA. This gene is conserved. Any guesses on what that word, <coughs> sorry, in relation to genes means? Conserved. Well, think about political. When we talk about cons someone being conservative, what do we imply? Be correct, but politically correct. Bill, what do we imply when somebody says, I'm a conservative? Do they like what, what they don't like? I'm very conservative in my taste. I'm very conservative in my... They don't like change. So when we say genus conserved, it means that it doesn't change much. So we can say that in the same species, the gene is going to be exactly the same. In two different but very close species, the differences are going to be very, very small. Okay? So we can, we can rightfully hypothesize that if those genes, 16S RNA genes, are very different between two species, the species are very far apart. Does that make sense? <clears throat> So he was working on the microbes, bacteria, he was doing a lot of work. Well, his lab mates were doing most of the bench work. And one day he uh, met his uh, colleague who was working on the same floor studying methanogenic microbes, little bugs that produced methane. Everybody thought it was bacteria and he asked him, hey, can I have a, <clears throat> a sp specimen of your bacteria for this this phylogenetic analysis sure answered his colleague he got the specimen they isolated DNA from those methanogens they sequenced 16s RNA genes they compared it to other 16s RNA genes from bacteria and Carl Bowes pretty much exclaimed it's a little bit of you know I kind of over exaggerate but probably didn't exclaim bullshit, but he was really, really impressed with the results because results didn't make any sense. That was not bacteria. It looked like bacteria, it walked like bacteria, but it was not a bacteria by any means. So they repeated the experiment and results stayed confirmed. Turned out they discovered a domain of life. Essentially, Woese found that above classes, above phyla, above kingdoms, there are three fundamental domains of life. Bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. <clears throat> Essentially, Woese discovered archaea, separated them. Both archaea and bacteria are prokaryotic. Eukarya, obviously, have nucleus. That makes sense? Although we, a lot of uh, biologists now suggest that we ha should forget the word prokaryotes because it's not relevant. It kind of puts together two entirely different domains. But it's really convenient to use it when we describe the cell structure because bacteria and archaea have a lot in common in terms of the cellular structure, they're both prokaryotic, they do not have membrane-bound organelles, and so on. But if you would look at this tree, you will see that the common ancestor initially split into bacteria and common ancestor for archaea and eukarya. So essentially, archaea and eukaryotes are closer to each other than bacteria and eukaryotes. Does that make sense? So those, those uh, freaky methanogens 
that can be found, I don't know, in Hot Springs of Yellowstone National Park look closer to humans than stuff, epidermitis that lives on our skin, genetically. That was really a huge, huge discovery. Okay. So you have to, I sometimes forget, but I try to summarize the uh, take-home message, what you have to understand. The concept of binomial nomenclature, genus species, and those two different classifications, what they based on and five kingdoms versus three domains. Does that make sense? Any questions? Now this table, um, this, I would love to have a conversation about some of these things. This is very subjective, I, I must say. So this is my take on the microbiology milestones. Somebody else may say it's different. That's what I think and suggest. But probably the most important steps in microbiology. The fact that diseases are infectious. That fact was known as far back as in China, Greece, and Rome, in ancient times. Chinese actually noticed that people who suffered from smallpox You've heard about smallpox, right? So, people with smallpox, they have little pustules on the skin, filled with fluid. Chinese poked those pustules, collected fluid, and scraped it into the skin of the healthy people. Kind of rough procedure. Uh, smallpox mortality, 30%. Mortality after the procedure called variolation, that was... Chinese doing was 1%. I mean, you get very late, you have 1% chance of dying. But if you didn't die, you're safe. You're not going to die from smallpox ever, which is kind of neat. Exactly. But we call it separately, and we'll get to why we call it not, why we don't call it vaccination. Okay. Uh, Greeks, uh, Hippocrates suggested that diseases are actually natural, not the wrath of gods, which I believe they thought they were. And the guy named Varro suggested that diseases may be caused by little tiny creatures. They didn't have microscopes, so they never saw them. However, they made the first sewer, the Romans. They actually built a sewer to avoid... Uh, human waste running on the street because they knew that there is a transmission of disease from human waste to humans and they actually made the sewer in the way that sewage system didn't contaminate the drinking supply so they separated those that was smart um, so all of this the existence of microbes wasn't known until Leeuwenhoek and Hook Leeuwenhoek was Netherland uh, fella who was a glass master actually made first telescope although it's kind of debatable and first microscope and he looked at it at microbes and he saw them hook was robert hook was a british scientist he was scientist who proposed the microscope Not as we know it, not those fancy things, but the actual concept. Eyepiece, objective piece, table, light source, that was hook. So they were first to see, but look, seeing microbes and implying them in the disease are two different stories. Now we come to vaccination. 1796, I wasn't there. I, I tell like I was like sitting next to Jenner, but no, I wasn't. 1796, Edward Jenner, British physician, notices that milkmaids who contracted cowpox, the form of the cow disease, uh, that caused some rash on the hands, they never acquired smallpox afterwards. He made a conclusion that cowpox infection protects against the smallpox disease. And then he did experiment 
that would never be able in, never, never would be possible in modern times. Uh, farm boy James Phipps was inoculated with a cowpox material. And a couple of weeks later, the same boy was inoculated with an actual smallpox. It was kind of an acute experiment. If the idea was wrong, the poor fella, that 10 year old, would die. Well, it worked. James Phipps survived, and it was really a huge breakthrough. Now, why do we call this procedure vaccination? Linguistically, vaca is cow in Latin. But what is the difference, fundamental difference, between Jenner's vaccination and ancient Chinese variolation? Can you tell me? Uh, expand. Okay. Jenner. Very good. Yes. <clears throat> so, variolation, when you use an actual infection to create the immunity. In vaccination, you never use the full strength pathogen. It's either killed pathogen or weak one, like in case of Jenner. Does that make sense? You see the difference? Like with chicken pox, we now use vaccine. Before, have you heard about chicken pox parties? That's what? That's your question? That was, it's a good question. It's, I, I really like that you ask it. Um, people, in or, chicken pox, when you're adult, Chicken pox is much more severe. I'm not talking about shingles, just chicken pox by itself. So what they did, if one kid contracted chicken pox, they bundled them all together, gave them lollipops, and inoculated them all. And then they all suffered. You don't have to do that. Now we have a vaccine. Okay. So <clears throat> next big step was the idea that disease can be contracted from the environment and actually studying how it can be spread. John Snow, uh, not the one that knows nothing, different John Snow. Um, hmm? <clears throat> they lived in slightly different times and slightly different places and had slightly different occupation. Uh, John Snow, British physician, li lived in London, noticed that pattern of cholera cases uh, in some areas of London was quite remarkable. It kind of was, those cholera cases were grouped. So he started to survey why they were grouped. What he found out that cholera patients in a certain London neighborhood were all taking drinking water from the same well. Well, guess what? That well was infected with cholera. That was officially recognized as the birth of modern epidemiology. Because when you think about epidemiology, it's not just sitting in the lab. It's a lot of social studies, like what people do, why it is spread, what happens. If we, I don't know, if we shut down the airport, will it stop the spread of disease? What we have to do to avoid the spread? Okay, so it's a lot of math, stats, sociology, economics, and stuff like that. <clears throat> in fact, I don't know if you've heard, uh, there is an Epidemiology Intelligence Service, EIS, as a part of CDC, and it's a uniform service. So people have uniform, they don't carry guns, but they have uniforms, they have ranks, and it's quite a, and they investigate outbreaks. It's quite an interesting uh, job. And up to this point, we already knew about microbes. We already knew that they probably cause the disease. But where do they come from? Where does life come from? Do we know? No, we don't. Actually, I have another question. Is that life... That event when life appeared, is that a subject of science? Strictly speaking, 
Okay, a couple of uh, people who think yes. Any other takes on that? Not necessarily. Like, look, if I'm if I climb up on that roof, jump from it, and survive, can you study why I did that? What do you have to do? What I have to do, so you can study? Yes, I have to jump again. Okay. With life, it's kind of impossible. It's one-time event. Science cannot do that unless unless we have another life-generating moment. Okay. So far, actually, biologists aren't really concerned about how life appears. It's kind of interesting to chat about, but it's kind of useless, wasting the breath. Anyway, you know, the only thing, the only spontaneous generation that we know about is when mice appear in the piles of dirty socks. You know that, right? Last class, one student asked, is that a joke? Um, so, there was a theory that life is generated spontaneously, just pops out. Those microbes pop out. If you leave dead body outside in the summer, and then you will come back later, like a week later, and take a stick and, you know, kind of poke it a little bit. What's going to crawl out of that body? Hmm? Maggots. Maggots, worms, right? So the idea was they spontaneously generated there. We now know they didn't. So Francesco Reddy, in 17th century, did a very elegant experiment. He took two pieces of meat, put them in the trays, covered one tray with a cloth. So flies couldn't see it on. Well, guess what? The covered one didn't have any maggots. That was first blow. Jablot uh, prepared the hay extract. And boiled one didn't boil another. Obviously, boiled one um, didn't have any bacterial growth. The one that wasn't boiled had plenty of bacteria growing. But it wasn't really convincing because if you just boil it and leave it, Eventually, it will catch some. They didn't know about that. Until Pasteur, who did, huh? He did, well, they didn't have autoclaves. That was a problem. The best they could do is just to boil. <clears throat> Pasteur did a lovely thing. Took two flasks. Like, this is the flask with a neck shaped like this. So any air, any air contaminants would be trapped right here. That make sense? Made broth, <clears throat> boiled it, and then broke the neck in one of the flasks right here. Well, about a week later, the flask with the broken neck got the growth. The flask with the neck intact didn't. You can still see it, sterile, in a Pasteur museum in Paris, after about more than 100 years. It's still sterile. That's quite remarkable. Okay, so <clears throat> it was pretty much the last thing. Say no spontaneous generation. You see, I crossed it out here. Uh, roughly at the same time, different scientists, including Schwann that you may have heard, in AP1, Schladen and Virchow, they proposed not only <clears throat> that all living things composed of cells, but also that one cell is derived from another either by division or by differentiation. That was a, a breakthrough. And then, in the middle of 19th century, came, sorry, came Chuck. Chuck brought with him one of the, Charles Darwin, Chuck, not Chuck Norris. Um, he proposed the idea of evolution. How many of you heard that evolution is just a theory? The statement, oh, evolution is just a theory. Heard it? Well, so is gravity. Go jump from the roof. 
it's not just, it's a theory. You can see it working. It's actually a law, a fundamental principle. Um, but, of course, the theory of evolution in the Darwin form is nothing, well, very little in common with the modern theory. Theory has been developed uh, significantly. And you see, I put the statement, it's a keystone. Almost everything that we're going to talk about, we have to keep in mind evolution. We have to ask ourselves, what are the repercussions of whatever we talk for the evolution? Or what is the evolutionary advantage of it? What is the evolutionary reason? We're going to take everything through the prism of evolution. Darwin was not aware of the work of Gregor Mendel, who fairly at the same time proposed first mechanisms of genetics working on peas. Since then we discovered that many genes do not follow Mendelian genetics, but nevertheless he made the huge first steps explaining how heredity works. In the meanwhile, in public health, there were some quite remarkable advancements. The surgical operation in the beginning of 19th century would probably look like this. You would have a surgeon that would do this, grab a knife from the floor, well, I can't exaggerate, but grab a knife, cut you open. And then it's your luck versus microbes, whether you're going to die or not. Um, uh, you have probably in some movies about like medieval times, when there's a wound, they use, huh? Well, if you want to call uh, a red hot sword a cauterizer, yes. <laughs> so yeah, they, they essentially they cauterize the wound. Why? There's no. Well, there's they didn't have other option. Okay, uh, so it's kind of it sucked to be sick in those days. Um, Zimmelweis, Ignaz Zimmelweis, the uh, Hungarian-born physician who worked in maternity ward in uh, Vienna Hospital, noticed, he was really bothered by the fact that many uh, m mothers, like newborn mothers after the delivery, they caught so-called purpural fever, which in modern terms is sepsis. Microbes were acquired during the delivery because when there is a delivery, there is a lot of blood, mother's blood is exposed, and then most of them didn't survive. And the death rate was bad, about a quarter of um, new parents, post postpartum women died of uh, purpural fever. He was bugged by it, but he noticed that women uh, who were taken care of by midwives had better chances of survival and lower rate of purpural fever than women who were cared by the medical residents. Any ideas why? Hmm? Okay. Medical residents cross contaminations, one patient to another patient. They actually went from those guys were working on maternity ward, but they were working with another set of very, very special patients. The ones that never complain. Yes. They were going straight from the morgue after the autopsy to deliver a baby. Forget about hand wash. I mean, there was no such thing. <clears throat> Midwives were doing only deliveries. So, he proposed to wash hands with a chlorine solution. Uh, the percentage went down to like 1 or 4% of postpartum women now caught purpural fever. So, it was a huge advancement. Uh, the problem was that uh, his uh, findings were not uh, warmly welcomed by um, the medical community. Now, it's called Zemmelweis syndrome. When new discoveries uh, are repelled, where the community community kind of sticks to the uh, traditional things. Zimmelweis became quite misanthropic uh, and uh, died 
in a mental asylum where he was placed two months before his death by his wife and and his best friend so it doesn't really improve my trust in people uh, that story Lister uh, James Lister had a much better story he was a British physician who first proposed the clean techniques of surgery <clears throat> He used a water solution of phenol, so-called carbolic acid, to spray on the wounds, which is rather barbaric. If you took organic chemistry, phenol, work with phenol, it's freaking toxic. If you take the solid phenol in your arm and hold it for several minutes, it's going to give you a, a chemical burn. But better than nothing, so he sprayed carbolic acid in the wounds, uh, and it prevented a lot of um, infections. Actually, he was a consultant, the like disinfection consultant on the appendectomy of one of British incoming kings before coronation, and king didn't die because it wasn't he wasn't die he the main chance was to die of sepsis, not of the surgery itself. Um, just on the side, so the history of Anti-sepsis is what 150 years. Um, think about the fact that um, anesthesia came around that time. So if you would look at pictures, there is actually a, a picture of Lister doing the surgery on the patient. And if you look closer, there is a yes, properly secured patient as you should know, does not require anesthesia, okay? So people, I mean, it was on the live patient. <clears throat> now, uh, Pasteur, at the end of 19th century, he's considered one of the greatest microbiologists of all time. He made several advancements. First of all, he showed that fermentation is caused by bacteria. Second, he saved... Um, French wine industry by just inventing pasteurization. That's what he is praised for in France. Not for rabies vaccine, no. For wine. Who cares about medicine? And he first uh, proposed the germ theory of disease. He suggested that those minuscule creatures were actually causing the disease. Uh, but Robert Koch, uh, approximately at the same time, <clears throat> Uh, laid out postulates that now, well, at that time were used to establish the link between the isolated microbe and the disease in the same patient, which is not really easy. Um, in late, again, late 19th century, like 1890, Vanovsky and Bergerink discovered viruses almost finishing uh, discovering the field of microbiology. And then in 20th century, I placed three major breakthroughs. Um, basic mechanisms of immunity by Ehrlich and Mechnikov. Mechnikov uh, proposed phagocytosis, cells eating other cells. Ehrlich proposed antibodies, like serum-based immunity. They were rivals. They didn't like each other. They thought another one was totally wrong. 1908, they both got Nobel Prize because it turned out they both were right. Everybody, in, uh, everyone in different field. Um, until 1920, if you acquired strep throat, you had about 80% chance of dying or developing some really horrible disease like scarlet fever or endocarditis. Fleming, Alexander Fleming, um, kind of accidentally in 1921, I think, discovered uh, penicillin. And approximately at the same time, chemists at the company, German chemical company Bayer, discovered first synthetic antimicrobial uh, called uh, sulfonamide. Uh, the, the derivatives of those are still in use, like amoxicillin, derivative of penicillin, Sulfamethoxazole would be a derivative of sulfonamide. It would be wrong to say there were no antimicrobials before there was. Ehrlich introduced Salversan, 
to treat syphilis, Salversan was based on mercury. It was toxic. I mean, you didn't die, but you suffered a lot. Well, it cured syphilis. And finally, in the middle of 20th century, um, a bunch of folks discovered the whole concept of DNA, genes, mechanisms of gene expression. And to be honest, that discovery, in my opinion, completely changed the way we look at living things. It's one of the greatest discoveries of all time. Because now we understand what's going on in either bacteria or humans at a totally different level. So, <clears throat> enough with history. Before we, before we will chat about methods and other things, uh, I think it's useful to, to refresh things about chemistry and biological molecules. Um, most of the things that we're going to study are like 99% water, except for viruses. And they're going to be living in watery environments of some sorts. So <clears throat> I don't want to go on and on and on about importance of water for life and blah, blah, blah. Well, no. Uh, important thing to remember is that water molecule is a polar, right? Polar molecule with oxygen having partially negative charge and hydrogens having partially positive. Positive and negative charges, what they do? They attract. So that's why water is liquid, actually. It shouldn't be, but it is. Okay? Because those molecules attract to each other and being held together. Now, they not only can be attracted to each other, they can be attracted to other positive or negative ions. So cation, like sodium, or anion, like chloride, will be hydrated. Even more than that, any partially positive, partially positively charged hydrogen can form hydrogen bond with a negative charge. Does that make sense? <clears throat> Say, ammonia. There's a little bit of negative charge on hydrogen. Ammonia is perfectly soluble in water. You can dissolve like 700 liters of ammonia gas in one liter of water, something like this, because it interacts with those charges so well. It turns out hydrogen bonds <clears throat> extremely important, for instance, to hold two strands of DNA in the double helix together. When proteins, chains of amino acids, fold, and they, they do fold, a lot of that folding is because of hydrogen, hydrogen bonds. Okay? But that's one thing about water. Now, pH. Don't worry. Oh, well, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get to it after the slide. One thing that I forgot to mention in the previous one. You don't have to know that Diet Coke has pH of 2. You don't have to. What I, what I want you to understand, what is neutral? What is neutral? P number 7. What is acidic? Lower than 7, right? And basic is, uh, somebody said water is neutral. If I will take water, like uh, distilled water, Put it here in the beaker, what's going to be the pH? It's going to be 6 and a little change. It's going to be lower than 7. Any idea why? There's some gas in the air that makes it acidic. Hmm? Carbon dioxide, yes. Carbon dioxide makes everything a little acidic. Okay? What is the life, the human normal pH of the extracellular fluid? 
7.4, yes. Slightly higher than 7.4 and it's pretty tight. And we actually like 7.45, it's alkalosis. 7.35, it's acidosis. So it's very tight. Look at the bacteria. H. pylori survives around here. In your stomach. Thermoplasma. That's freaking thing. Lives in the acid runoff from the copper mines. The pH between 1 and 0. So it's like acid that would burn you. This thing lives there. And it will die if you expose it to neutral pH. There are microbes that live around here, like Natrobacter. So microbes occupy all range of pH. Some species live but they will live at the certain range okay some of them will live only in acid some of them will live at the neutral pH and so on and so forth but they have a vast range of capabilities now one thing that I want to mention about this table you may wonder holy crap do I have to memorize all that shit uh, the answer is um, not really you will not get the answer least I don't know three scientists that provided major breakthrough in the uh, area of public health because it's too subjective but what I may and will ask is the major contribution of Robert Koch in the field of microbiology is one two three four now my one thing that I really really stick to and try to stick to first of all I try not to provide really trick questions. Like for this, I will give you four answers and only one will make real sense. So I would take Robert Koch and I will provide you answers from different lines. And those answers are not really similar, okay? So I will tell you, he, he's done first vaccination, he proposed the postulates uh, linking microbes and disease, he, I don't know, did variolation and something else. So only one makes sense, they're very different, okay? Second thing, I will never ask things that were not in the PowerPoint, that I did not mention, or if they not in the PowerPoint, I will tell you, look, this is not here, write it down, and I will put it on the whiteboard or on the screen write it down I'm gonna ask this okay otherwise it's not in the exam does that make sense I can guarantee it hundred percent don't do that right. um, we're gonna chat about carbohydrates for a second and I will let you go what you have to know about carbs they consist of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And that they form polymers. Monosaccharides, like glucose or galactose, can combine together and form longer chains. When they combine, they release water. It's a reaction of dehydration. Two combined will yield disaccharide. Three, trisaccharide, and so on and so forth. So you will have polymers like this okay either branched or linear branched or linear polymers that can consist only of glucose molecules or glucose and galactose okay I provided some examples of disaccharides here just to you I had a question do we have to draw this formula no don't worry about that and I will not ask you to recognize whether it's galactose or glucose or fructose I may ask you what you're looking at is lipid amino acid or monosaccharide and believe me they are so different I mean you cannot really mix them up okay um, you can break them down those polysaccharides by hydrolysis pretty much adding water back Okay, um, so it's, uh, 
water is going away so adding water back you break them apart okay and you break them apart so they can do their major function provide energy either in the respiration or in the process of fermentation they also serve as the structural elements they modify lipids forming glycolipids and modify proteins forming glycoproteins ribose and deoxyribose are important parts the saccharides are important parts of the dna and rna molecules here so they are involved in many biochemical processes in the cell but probably the most uh, outstanding function is energy okay source of energy that makes sense any questions okay <clears throat> 